Singapore, financial hub, cultural melting pot, and superpower on the rise. Hi, I'm David Beer, and welcome to 60 Minutes. Tonight, we're going to be showcasing one of the Asian business world's hidden gems, being Singapore. The tiny city-state is poised to take on the world, and soon. Let's begin. Few nations have had as colorful a past as Singapore. During the 1400s, it was the capital of the Malacca Sultanate, a Muslim state founded by an ousted Indonesian prince. In the 1500s, ownership of the island passed over to the Portuguese, and then to the Dutch the following century. In 1819, the famed British East India Company established one of their most important trading posts in the city, making it a full-blown colony five years later. The Japanese took the island in World War II, giving it back to Britain after the war until it was finally granted independence in 1959. This storied history has given the city-state a rather unique culture. Singapore's roots are in Malaysia, in the wider geocultural zone of Southeast Asia, and its largest ethnic group is the Chinese, but it has also adopted cultural practices of other groups including the British, the Indians, the Portuguese, and the Dutch, not to mention the Americans. This has created an interesting blend of Eastern and Western practices that is unique to the country. I went into the field to Nations Fine Foods in downtown Toronto to try and get a taste of Singaporean cuisine. Nations is an international grocery store carrying food items from all around the world, but it does have a particularly strong Southeast Asian section. They say that food is the window into culture, and what better way to get to know Singaporean culture than to experience it firsthand? Walking up and down the aisles, I really got a feel for what makes Southeast Asian food so unique. There were all sorts of new flavor profiles that I had never even seen before. The main staple foods of Singaporean cuisine are noodles and rice. This is borrowed from their East Asian neighbors to the north. The wet and warm climate of Southeast Asian countries such as Singapore is much more suitable to growing rice than wheat. This climate also allows for the growth of all sorts of unique fruits. These include the jackfruit, the breadfruit, the pomelo, the rambutan, and many, many more. In terms of meat, lots of beef, chicken, and pork is used, including parts that we in the West throw away, such as stomachs, intestines, and even feet. As well, with Singapore being an island, lots of fish is used. Lots and lots of fish. With all of these crazy new flavors, I decided I'd go experience some of the Singaporean food for myself. Due to convenience, people in Singapore don't often eat in restaurants, but rather at hawker centers, which are essentially massive food courts. Singapore's unique blend of cultures can be seen directly in its food. Here I have some Chinese chili chicken and an Indian curry. And how could I forget Singapore's national dish, Hainanese chicken? To finish things off on a sweet note, I got some sesame rice balls with a red bean paste filling. There is, of course, much more to Singapore's culture than its food. The country's national languages are Malay, English, Mandarin, and Tamil, and its main religions are Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Taoism, and Buddhism, again as a result of its multi-ethnic past, although about a third of the population is atheist or non-practicing. Major festival dates widely observed in Singapore include Diwali, Eid al-Fitr, and most importantly, Chinese New Year. Singapore has a long tradition of Malay music, such as the song currently playing. That being said, it also has a notably large pop music scene, with artists performing in all four of the nation's languages. One very popular and somewhat unique pastime among Singaporeans is stand-up comedy. There are three major comedy clubs in the city, all of which are visited quite frequently by locals. In fact, comedy is a big hobby among the country's citizens. Singaporeans place a large emphasis on democracy, justice, diversity, and academic success, not to mention cleanliness. Singapore is home to some of the wealthiest individuals in Asia, and is therefore one of the East's most luxurious destinations. With designer stores, swanky restaurants, and five-star hotels galore, the city is a playground for the world's elite. Singapore is an island steeped in tradition and history. With a background so diverse and unique, and a status as the cultural link between East and West, the country seems uniquely poised to take on the world by storm. Singapore's government practices democratic elections every six years and parliamentary elections every five. The executive branch of the government of Singapore is made up of the president and the parliamentary cabinet, which is in turn composed of the prime minister and several other acting ministers. It is the cabinet that controls the government, meaning that despite the president's title as the head of state, the prime minister has the most power. The cabinet is formed by the political party that gains a simple majority in each general election. The country practices a multi-party political system. 
Lee Hsien Loong, an ethnic Chinese, has been the acting prime minister of Singapore since 2004. He took over the leadership of the People's Action Party when former Prime Minister Go Chok Tong stepped down from the position. Lee then led the party to victory in 2006, 2011, and 2015 general elections. Lee is the eldest son of Singapore's first Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew. In order to learn more about Singapore's political climate, I sat down with the Prime Minister Lee to discuss his political strategy. Good afternoon and thank you for joining me. I want to start with a more general question. So, what makes a good government? Accountable, honest, competent, effective. Earlier you mentioned that a government should be more competent. What do you mean by that? You have to be responsive to the people, able to look beyond the short term and keep us safe and successful. Do you believe in holding politicians accountable for their decisions? Our political system must foster accountability so that the government is always kept on its toes and will always be motivated to look after the interests of Singaporeans. What's your stance on government action? We must have a system where the government does not, over time, become complacent, go soft, or even worse, become corrupt. Do issues such as immigration and ethnicity matter to you? Our political system must uphold a multiracial society. Minority Singaporeans must have the confidence that they will not ever be marginalized or shut out or discriminated against. I understand that your politics involve regional leaders called mayors, but your country is one city. If you compare them with the mayor of London or the mayor of New York, it's what they call Xiao Wu Jian Da Wu. It's a small personality, same title, but it's quite a different entity indeed. What will you do to make an impact on the government of Singapore? Stabilizers. And especially we need stabilizers in two areas, protecting our reserves and safeguarding the integrity of our public service. Thanks for your time. I really learned a lot during this interview. Singapore is an incredibly capitalist nation that puts a huge emphasis on private industry. They are very pro-business, have low tax rates, and have the third highest per capita GDP in the world at $57,714.30 USD. The country's national GDP is 323.91 billion USD. The Singapore dollar is the official currency of Singapore. One Singapore dollar is equivalent to 72 cents USD or 95 cents Canadian. Singapore occupies a strategic location at the mouth of the Malacca Strait, which feeds the South China Sea, the most important body of water to the East Asian trade. Singapore welcomes foreign trade and investment, and people from all over the world find the country as a hub for the diversity in both business and culture. Singapore's major exports include electrical machinery, organic chemicals, plastics, oil, and pharmaceuticals. Top multinational corporations that have established their regional headquarters in Singapore include UPS, BMW, and Sony. I sat down again with Prime Minister Lee to discuss economics. Thank you again for meeting with me. Tell me about steps your country has taken to grow the economy in the past. So you grow by getting the unemployed people employed. It's not easy, but you create the jobs for them, you build the factories, mm -hmm. and life improves. Then we reach full employment. What do you do next? We got the women into the workforce, and increasingly women, instead of staying at home, started working and earning. So we have two income families. Then eventually, Many women are working. What do you do next? Well, we brought in foreign workers to top us up mm -hmm. so that we could make good in the places where we don't have enough. So can you describe the climate for business in Singapore right now? New technology, new players, new competitors, new partners to cooperate with. So how does this translate into dollars? You are making money and profit and doing well. We have a role and we can prosper. Country can Singapore offer economically? We have the schemes, we have the emphasis, we are talking about skills future, upgrading people that will help further. Thank you so much for your time. Singapore is a very diverse society consisting of three main ethnic groups, Chinese, Malay and Indian, with Chinese being the largest of these. With a relatively large population for such a small island, Singapore has a rich tapestry of customs and etiquette. The ethnic mix results in a very diverse nation in both culture and religion.
In terms of dress, make sure to wear light clothes, as the Singaporean climate is quite warm. This includes clothing made out of cotton and other breathable fabrics. Heavy jackets and dark colors such as these are not worn as much. But don't get too carried away, showing too much skin in public is seen as inconsiderate to the nation's Muslim population. Outside of a business setting and with high fashion rather than casual wear, comfort and experimentation are key parts of Singaporean style. With a white jumpsuit, high heels, a handbag, and silver jewelry, this Singaporean is following the current high fashion trend seen all over upper class Asia. Don't touch people's heads, since that part of the body is considered sacred. As well, don't point at anyone with your forefinger, Singaporeans find that very rude. And just to be safe, try not to slam your fist against your palm, as that's an obscene gesture. Or stand with your hands on your hips, which is aggressive and antisocial. Don't chew gum, Singaporeans are very serious about cleanliness and have strict regulations against public gum chewing. This can result in a fine of up to $500, but an exception is made for therapeutic purposes with a prescription. You can also be fined for smoking, littering, spitting, and jaywalking, almost all of which could result in a $1,000 fine. Not to mention the fact that you can't show your feet either. In Singapore, they find feet quite dirty and it's considered offensive to point with your toes. Try not to make jokes until you know a person well, as they are generally considered informal and inappropriate. Make sure not to bring up one's religion or political views, and definitely don't say anything negative about the government. It's not illegal, but locals take issue with it. You can, however, bring up things that we in the West often consider private, such as weight or marriage. Don't show too much emotion in public. Singaporeans believe that one's public persona should always appear cool, calm, and collected. Public displays of affection are also perceived badly. When at a hawker center, make sure you don't sit at a table with a tissue package on it. This means that it has been choked or reserved by someone else. Always bring a gift when going to a function at someone else's house in Singapore and make sure you give it to them with both hands. Don't expect to see their reaction though, as gifts are not to be open in the presence of the giver. Oh, and make sure you take your shoes off. As many Malay people are Muslim, avoid giving gifts containing alcohol or pork, and all other gifted meats must be halal. For the Chinese, items used for cutting, such as knives or nail clippers, are taken as a sign that you want to cut the recipient out of your life. If buying sets of things, give an even number, as odd numbers are thought of as unlucky. A significant number of Indians in Singapore are Hindu. As it is forbidden to kill cattle, avoid giving gifts made from leather such as belts, shoes, and bags. In contrast with Chinese recipients, if you choose to give money, give an odd number. When men are dressing formally, jackets are generally not required due to the heat, and ties may or may not be depending on the occasion. The female method of formal dress consists of a blouse worn with pants or a skirt. Always be on time for any business meetings with Singaporeans. Punctuality is considered very important. Make sure to shake hands firmly with everyone at a business meeting. Business gifts are never to be given, as these are often misconstrued as bribes. Singaporeans may bow slightly as they shake your hand. This gesture is generally reserved for Chinese and elders. When addressing someone in Singapore, it is recommended to use the titles of Mr., Mrs., or Miss, and only use their first names when you're invited to. Business cards should generally have both English and Chinese printed on them. Offer the cards with both hands, face up with the letters oriented toward the recipient. Receive the card with both hands as well, study it for a moment, and leave it face up on the table. Dining is by far the most common form of business entertainment, and is generally done at restaurants under these circumstances. Allow the host to order dishes, and do your best not to refuse any orders of food. Most food in Singapore is meant to be shared, with all platters brought to the table at once. Never leave the chopsticks laying on the plate, as that is considered quite rude. When going out to eat, the tip or service charge is included in the bill, and leaving extra money for the server is actually considered somewhat condescending. It can take a long time to make connections in Singapore, but the people you know are often considered even more important than the company you work for. Your Singaporean counterparts must genuinely like, feel at ease with, and trust you in order to be successful. Don't schedule meetings on religious holidays such as Eid, Vesak Day, Diwali, or Christmas. Also, avoid correcting others or calling them out for their mistakes, as this will cause them to lose face, which can destroy one's reputation. 
Singapore is a culture of subtleties and behavioral cues that only the initiated can pick up on. It isn't always easy to tell what's good and what isn't, but their importance should never be underestimated. Dress, etiquette, dining style, and formalities are all vital factors when it comes to the interpersonal relations within this small Asian city-state. Thank you all for watching. This has been 60 Minutes. I'm David Beer, and have a good night.